From the Teeth of the Tide. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Teeth of the Tide by Charles G. D. Roberts. From the House in the Water. A Book of Animal Stories. Hitherto, ever since he had been old enough to leave the den, the mother bear had been leading her fat black cub inland among the tumbled rocks and tangled spruce and pine teaching him to dig for tender roots and nose out grubs and beetles from the rotting stumps Today, feeling the need of saltier fare she led him in the opposite direction down through a cleft in the cliffs and out across the great red glistening mud flats left bare by the ebb of the terrific fundy tides from the secure warmth of his den the cub had heard faint and far off the waves thundering along the bases of the cliffs when the tide was high and the great winds drew heavily in from the sea the sounds had always made him afraid and to-day though there was no wind and the tide was so far out that it made no noise but a soft whisper silken and persuasive he held back with babyish timidity till his mother brought him to his senses with an unceremonious cuff on the side of the head with a squall of grieved surprise he picked himself up shaking his head as if he had a bee in his ear and then made haste to follow obediently close at his mother's huge black heels from the break in the cliffs where the bears came down ran a ledge of shelving rocks on a long gradual slant across the flats toward the edge of low water the tide was nearing the last of the ebb and now the slope of the shore being very gradual and the difference between high and low water in these turbulent channels something between forty and fifty feet the lapsing fringes of the ebb yellow tawny with silt were a good three-quarters of a mile away from the foot of the cliffs the vast spaces between were smooth oily copper-red mud shining and treacherous in the sun with the narrow black outcrop of the ledge drawn across on so gentle a slant that before it reached the water it was running almost on a parallel with the shoreline along the rocky ledge the old bear led the way pausing to nose at a patch of seaweed here and there or to glance shrewdly into the shallow pools among the rocks the cub obediently followed her example though doubtless with no idea of what he might hope to find but the upper stretches of the ledge near high-water mark offered nothing to reward their quest having been dry for several hours and long ago thoroughly gone over by earlier foragers so the bears pushed on down towards the lower stretches where the ledges were still wet and the long black-green weed masses still dripping and where the limpet covered protuberances of rock still oozed and sparkled with her iron-hard claws the mother bear scraped off a quantity of these limpets and crushed them between her jaws with relish swallowing the salty juices the cub tried clumsily to imitate her but the limpets defied his too tender claws so he ran to his mother thrust her great head aside and greedily licked up a share of her scrapings the sea flavor tickled his palate but the rough hard shells exasperated him they hurt his gums so that he merely rolled them over in his mouth sucked at them a few moments then spat them out indignantly his mother thereupon forsook the unsatisfactory limpets and went prowling on towards the water's edge in search of more satisfying fare as they left the limpets a gaunt figure in grey homespuns carrying a rifle appeared on the crest of the cliffs above caught sight of them and hurriedly took cover behind an overhanging pine the young woodsman's first impulse was to try a long shot at the hulking black shape so conspicuous out on the ledge against the bright water he wanted a bearskin even if the fur was not just then in prime condition but more particularly he wanted the cub to tame and play with if it should prove amenable and to sell ultimately for a good amount to some travelling show on consideration he decided to lie in wait among the rocks till the rising tide should drive the bears back to the upland he exchanged his steel-nosed cartridges for the more deadly mushroom tip filled his pipe and lay back comfortably against the pine trunk to watch through the thin green frondage the foraging of his intended prey the farther they went down the long slant of the ledge 
the more interested the bears became. Here the crows and gulls had not had time to capture all the prizes. There were savory blue-shelled mussels clinging under the tips of the rocks, plump spiral whelks between the oozy tresses of the seaweed, orange starfish, and bristly sea urchins in the shallow pools. All these dainties had shells that the cubs' young teeth could easily crush, and they yielded meaty morsels that made beetles and grubs seem very meager fare. Moreover, in the salty bitter of this sea fruit, there was something marvelously stimulating to the appetite. From pool to pool, the old bear wandered on, lured ever by richer prizes just ahead, and the cub, stuffed till his little stomach was like a black furry ball, no longer frisked and tumbled, but waddled along beside her with eyes of shiny expectancy. As long as he was not too full to walk, he was not too full to eat such delicacies as these. The fascinating quest led them on and on, till at last they found themselves at the water's edge. By this time they had traveled a long way from the cleft in the cliffs by which they had come down from the uplands. A good half-mile of shining mud separated them in a direct line from the cliff base. And the woodsman on the height, as he watched them, muttered to himself, If that old bar don't look out, the tide's a-goin' to catch her afore she knows what she's about. Most wish I'd a socked it to her afore she'd got so far out. Jiminy, she's seed her mistake now. The tide's turned. While bear and cub had their noses and paws busy in a little dry pool, on a sudden a long, shallow, muddy-crested wave had come hissing up over their feet and filled the pool to the brim with its yellow flood. Lifting her head sharply, the old bear glanced at the far-off cliffs and at the mounting tide. Instantly realizing the peril, she started back at a slow, lumbering amble up the long, long path by which they had come, and the cub started, too, at a brave gallop not far behind her, for he was too much afraid of the hissing yellow wave, but close at her side, between her sheltering form and the shore. He felt that she could in some way ward off or subdue the cold and terrifying monster. For perhaps two minutes the cubs struggled on gamely, although owning to the fact that at this point their path was almost parallel with the water. The fugitives made no perceptible gain, and the rising wave was on their heels every instant. Then the greedy feeding produced its effect. The little fellow's wind gave out completely. With a whimper of pain and fright, he dropped back upon his haunches and waited for his mother to save him. The old bear turned, bounced back, and cuffed him so brusquely that he found breath enough to utter a loud squall and go stumbling forward for another score of yards. Then he gave out and sank upon his too distended stomach, whimpering piteously. This time the mother seemed to perceive that his case was serious and her anxious wrath subsided. She licked him assiduously for a few seconds, whining encouragement, till at last he got upon his feet again, trembling. The yellow flood was now lapping on the ledge all about them. But a rod or two farther on the rocks bulged up a couple of feet above the surrounding slope. Thrusting the exhausted youngster ahead of her with nose and paws, the old bear gained this point of temporary vantage, and then, worried and frightened, sat down upon her haunches and stared all around her, as if trying to decide what should be done. The cub lay flat, with legs outstretched and mouth wide open, panting. The tide, meanwhile, was mounting so swiftly that in a few moments the rise of rocks had become almost an island. The ledge was covered before them, as well as behind, and the only way still open lay straight over the glistening mud. The old bear looked at it, and whined, knowing its treacheries, and the woodsman, watching with eager interest from the cliffs, muttered, "'Take to it, ye old bug-eater. Thar ain't nothing else left for ye to do.' This was apparently the conclusion of the old bear herself, for now, after licking and nuzzling the cub for a few seconds till he stood up, she stepped boldly off the rock and started out over the coppery flats. The cub, having apparently recovered his wind, followed briskly. 
probably much heartened by the fact that his progress was in a direction away from the alarming waves there was a desperate need of haste for when they left the rocky lift the tide was already slipping around upon the flats beyond it nevertheless the old bear moved with deliberation she could not hurry the cup and she had to choose her path by some instinct or else by some peculiar keenness of observation she seemed to detect the honey-pots or deep pockets of slime that lay concealed beneath the uniformly shining surface of the mud for here she would make an aimless detour losing many precious seconds and there she would sidestep suddenly for several paces and shift her course to a new parallel outside the honey-pots the mud was soft and tenacious to a depth varying from a few inches to a couple of feet but with a hard clay foundation beneath the slime through this clinging red ooze the old bear with her huge strength made her way without difficulty but the cub in a few moments began to find himself terribly hampered his fur collected the mud his little paws sank easily but at each step it grew harder to withdraw them at last chancing to stagger aside from his mother's spacious tracks he sank to his belly in the rim of a honey-pot panic-stricken he floundered vainly his nose high in the air and his eyes shut tight while his mother unconscious of what had happened ploughed doggedly onward presently he opened his eyes his mother was now perhaps ten or a dozen feet ahead apparently deserting him right behind lapping up to his very tail was the crawling wave a heartbroken bawl burst from his throat at that cry the old bear came dashing back red mud halfway up her flanks and plastered all over her shaggy chest taking in the situation at a glance she seized the cub by the nape of the neck with her teeth and tried to drag him free but he squealed so lamentably that she realized that the hide would yield before the mud would the attempt had taken time however and the tide was now well up in the fur of his back thrusting her paw down beneath his haunches she tore him clear with a mighty wrench and a loud sucking of the baffled mud that stroke sent him head over heels some ten feet nearer safety by the time he had picked himself off pawing fretfully at the mud that bedaubed his face and half blinded him his mother was close behind him nosing him along and lifting him forward skilfully with her forepaws the slope of the flats was now so gradual as to be almost imperceptible and the tide therefore seemed to be racing in with fiercer haste as if in wrath at being so long balked of its prey engrossed in her efforts to push the cub forward the mother now lost some of her fine discrimination in regard to honey-pots she pushed the cub straight into one but jerked him back unceremoniously before the mud had time to get any grip upon him pausing for a moment to scrutinize the oozy expanse she thrust the little animal furiously along to the left searching for a safe passage before she could find one however the tide was upon them their feet splashing in the thin yellow wavelets a broken soap-box tossed overboard from some ship came washing up and stranded just before them with a whimper of delight as if he thought the box a safe refuge the cub scrambled upon it but his mother ruthlessly tumbled him off and hustled him onward floundering and splashing you'll have to swim for it old woman growled the now excited watcher behind the pine tree on the cliff as the creeping flood by this time overspread the ooze for a couple of yards ahead of them the mother could no longer discriminate as to what lay beneath it she could do nothing now but dash ahead blindly catching up the cub between her jaws in a grip that made him squeal she launched herself straight toward shore hardly daring to let her feet rest an instant where they touched fortune favored her in this rush she got ahead of the tide she gained upon it perhaps twice her body's length then she paused to drop the cub but the pause was fatal she began to sink instantly she had come upon a honey-pot of stiffer consistency than the rest which had sustained her while she was in swift motion but now 
in return for that support, clutched her in a grip the more inexorable. With all her huge strength, she strained to wrench herself clear. But in vain. She had no purchase. There was nothing to put forth her strength upon. In her terror and despair, she squealed aloud, with her snout high in the air, as if appealing to the blank, blue, empty sky. The cub, terror-stricken, strove to clamber upon her back. That harsh cry of hers, however, was but the outburst of one moment's weakness. The next moment the indomitable old bear was striving silently and systematically to release herself. She would wrench one great forearm clear, lift it high, and feel about for a solid foundation beneath the ooze. Failing in this, she would yield that paw to the enemy again, tear the other loose, and feel about for a foothold in another direction. At the same time she drew out her body to its full length and lay flat so that she might gain as much support as possible by distributing her weight. Because of this sagacity, and because the mire at this point had more substance than in most of the other honey-pots, she made a good fight, and almost, but not quite, held her own. By the time the tide had once more overtaken her she had sunk but a little way, and was still far from giving up the unequal struggle. Yet for all the great beast's strength and valor and devotion, there could have been but one end to that brave battle, and mother and cub would have disappeared in a few minutes more under the stealthily whispering onrush of the flood, had not the whimsical providence or hazard of the wild come curiously to their aid. Among the jetsam of those restless fundy tides, almost anything that will float may appear, from a matchbox to a barn. What appeared just now was a big spruce log escaped from the boom on some river emptying into the bay. It came softly wallowing in, lipped by the little waves, and passed close by the nose of the old bear, where she struggled with the water up to her shoulders. Quick as thought, she flashed up a heavy paw, caught the log by one end, and pulled the butt under her chest. The purchase thus gained enabled her to free the other paw, and in a few seconds more the weight of the fore part of her body was on the end of the log, forcing it down to the mud. Greedy as that mud was, it was yet incapable of engulfing a full-grown spruce timber quickly enough to defeat the bear's purpose. Stretching far forward on the submerged log, she strained her muscles to their utmost and slowly drew her hindquarters free from the deadly grip that held them. Then, seizing in her jaws the cub, which was swimming and whimpering beside her, she carefully felt her way farther along the log and sat down upon it to rest clutching the youngster closely in one great forearm. Not till the tide had risen nearly to her neck did the mother move again. She was recovering her strength. Utterly daunted by the peril of the honey-pots, she chose rather to trust the tide itself. At last, catching the cub again by the back of the neck, she swam for the shore. The tide was now within a couple of hundred yards from the bases of the cliffs, and lapping upon solid, sun-baked clay. The strong flood helping her, she swam fast, though laboriously, by reason of the burden in her teeth. Soon her hinder feet struck round, but she was afraid to trust it, and nervously drew them up beneath her. A few moments more, and she felt undeniably firm footing, whereupon she plunged forward with a rush, and never paused, even to drop the squirming cup, till she was above high-water mark. When at last she set the little beast down, she was in such a hurry to get away from the shore and back into the secure green woods that she would not trust him to follow her as usual, but drove him on ahead as fast as he could move toward the cleft in the cliffs. As they turned up the rugged trail her haste relaxed, and she went more slowly, but still driving the cub ahead of her, that she might be quite sure that the honey-pots would not reach up and clutch at him again. As the muddy, weary, bedraggled, pathetic-looking pair passed within tempting range of the pine tree on the cliff top, the woodsman instinctively threw forward his rifle. But the next moment he dropped it with a slight flush, and gave a quick glance around him as if he feared the unseen eyes might have taken note of the gesture. Hell, he'd muttered. 
I'd have been no better in a murderer if I'd have gone and plugged the old girl now. End of From the Teeth of the Tide by Charles G. D. Roberts Read by Jewel <laughs>